my name is Brian Williams and uh, I'm the chief of the uh, branch within the Peacebuilding Support Office uh, that uh, helps uh, to manage the Secretary General's Peacebuilding Fund from, uh, from day to day. Uh, very excited to be here to launch uh, our thematic review on climate security and peacebuilding. Uh, I want to start with a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, from the very beginning, we do have simultaneous translation today. So the three dot button with more, uh, if you go there, uh, you can get to a tab and select language interpretation. And we have English and French and Spanish. Uh, also, therefore, a reminder to uh, our presenters and panelists, uh, we do have simultaneous interpretation, so I'm sure we all have the habit of speaking quickly. Uh, let's try and uh, slow down a little bit. Uh, secondly, we will be recording today's uh, event, uh, just so everybody knows, uh, and we hope to have it up on the website, uh, on the PBSO website under the PBF window uh, soon. And we also will be having coming out uh, published versions of the thematic review in English and uh, in French and Spanish soon. So be on the lookout for that. And third and final housekeeping announcement uh, is that we are hoping uh, and planning to have 20 or 30 minutes of Q&A uh, at the end of this. We're scheduled for an hour and a half until 11 o'clock New York time. Uh, there is a Q&A uh, button also up on the top of the teams. Um, we'll be taking the questions in writing uh, today because we have a, a pretty large number. Uh, so if you as you think of questions along the way, uh, <clears throat> please don't hesitate to put them in there. Maybe just a couple of words about the thematic review before I hand over to our Assistant Secretary General Elizabeth Spehar for opening remarks. Uh, We've done the thematic review in partnership with FAO, UNICEF, uh, the Climate Security Mechanism, which is a, a partnership across several UN organizations, and the United Kingdom. Uh, very uh, pleased with all of that partnership, and thank you so much to everybody for their support. Uh, it's been led by the UN University's Center for Policy Research, which is based here in New York, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and it's looking, of course, at climate security and environmental peace building. Uh, in particular actions that were financed by the Peacebuilding Fund. Of course, there's a lot of good work being done by UN organizations beyond the PBF and, and by organizations beyond the UN, um, but we have a responsibility as the Peacebuilding Fund to be reviewing uh, in different ways what, uh, what the fund has been financing, and that's what this thematic review is about, is looking at uh, what we've financed. The sample uh, size, uh, 74 projects between 2017 and 2021. Uh, of course, our lead researchers will be presenting all this, so uh, I won't say very much more about it. Um, 74 projects, uh, three case studies, uh, one in the Leptako Gurma region uh, in between Burkina, Mali and Niger, uh, one in Yemen and uh, uh, an activity out in the Pacific Islands. Um, so really, it's been quite a wide ranging uh, study. Uh, we're going to be hearing today uh, from the research team. Um, Oliver and uh, Erica, uh, and then we're very lucky to have uh, three panelists as well, practitioners from the United Nations and from civil society. Um, and then at the end, we'll have uh, we'll have Q and A, uh, hopefully, which I will continue to moderate. Um, without further ado, then, uh, thanks everybody for being here, and I would like to uh, pass over to Assistant Secretary General uh, Elizabeth Spehar for a few minutes of opening remarks. Great, thank you so much, uh, Brian. I hope everyone can hear me uh, well. Uh, I'm also really thrilled to be uh, part of this this morning. Uh, from the get-go, I'd like to uh, excuse myself, though I will have to leave fairly shortly for another um, another commitment, but I, I really wanted to make sure I was here at the beginning uh, of this uh, launch of our latest thematic review, because I think it's, uh, and I'm sure you'll agree with me, it really is a, a review that is um, is timely and very, very topical as more and more member states are coming to us talking about the climate emergency and how that is affecting uh, the the situation of, of, of stability um, and peace in their own in their own countries. So it's more and more something that our member states have been asking us to take a very close uh, look at. So as Brian um, 
our chief of the financing for peacebuilding branch just mentioned uh, this thematic study um, this thematic review uh, was not done by pbso alone it was done together with a number of uh, of uh, very important uh, colleagues uh, and partners that i'd also like to acknowledge so un university my own pbso colleagues of course but also uh, un colleagues from fao unicef the climate security mechanism and also this has been done with the very uh, generous support of the government of the united kingdom uh, so thanks to to all who have participated um, for those of you that don't know the peace building support office uh, has been um, basically pursuing uh, thematic reviews on a regular basis and what we do try to do with these thematic reviews is to review uh, to look at global best practices and identify innovations on specific uh, topics we usually do one or two every year and um, as brian was mentioning as part of that we definitely uh, and in particular look at and try to learn from our own work through the peace building fund so we look at the performance and the contribution of the pbf to the specific topic uh, at hand um, I see this as a very clear demonstration of PBSO's uh, very strong commitment to continuous learning and improvement. And we do uh, believe that this is um, an important activity of ours to really expand the knowledge base on peace building amongst uh, all of us. Um, our hope is that this review in particular will uh, contribute to the, the growing knowledge base on the nexus between climate uh, security and, and peace building. I still believe it's a, it's a fairly new field, but one that has really taken on a momentum, particularly in the context of the latest COP uh, in, in Egypt. And as I was saying, uh, also in the context of a really quite strong increasing demand for support on climate security issues, particularly in Africa, but also elsewhere uh, in the world. And I, I would have to acknowledge while saying that, that um, even though the term climate security is uh, not universally embraced here at the UN, I think there are uh, a few member states that are not entirely comfortable with the terminology. Uh, what is, I think, universally understood or increasingly understood um, is that climate change is a risk multiplier, particularly in fragile and conflict affected countries, countries that already have a number of other um, uh, conflict tr uh, triggers very difficult uh, root causes of, of tension uh, and, and, and violence. This has come, uh, the effects of climate change to compound already very, very complex uh, scenarios in many countries where we, where we work. And as we know, climate change is disproportionately impacting the low income countries, the fragile countries, and typically the, the poorest and the most vulnerable communities within those countries. So clearly something we, we have to address and we have to see how to address this more effectively. Um, so we do hope that this study, uh, as, as I was saying, will help to uh, contribute to the knowledge base and that will help us to identify some good practices that not only ourselves at PBSO but others can replicate uh, or build upon. And uh, I, I do think we need to drill down more into you know, how we most effectively uh, address this nexus between climate security uh, and peace building. Uh, I, I was pleased to see that the uh, thematic review did point out that uh, PBSO together with its partners on this thematic review uh, have been quite a bit at the forefront of this field. Now there are more and more joining uh, joining this field, which I'm very glad of, but I think we, 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 can, we can say that we have done some groundbreaking work through this whole exercise, which has taken us uh, over one year uh, to complete. Um, let me just mention that in terms of PBSO and the Peace Building Fund in particular, between 2017 and 2021, uh, we supported 43 projects in 22 uh, countries that were implemented by 16 UN entities and five civil society organizations. Um, uh, so these initiatives were uh, supported by the Peace Building Fund, and we invested nearly $100 million towards climate security efforts in the framework of those, of those projects, of those initiatives. 
And our, I would say one of our the signature aspects in terms of the work that we support is that we are supporting integrated programmatic approaches across the nexus, nexus that are directed at preventing and resolving violent conflicts that are driven or exacerbated by climate change and environmental degradation in a particular country. Uh, also, we focus on these issues um, in cross-border contexts or in regional contexts in some cases, such as in the Pacific Island settings. Uh, some of the things that we focus on in particular, I'm sure you'll hear more about that shortly, are projects um, dealing with issues such as farmer herder conflicts, competition over natural resources, including conflict and disputes over water. This is an increasing concern in so many parts of, of the world. Um, we focus on climate adaptation strategies uh, and other related initiatives that are focusing on the effects, the adverse effects of climate change, uh, but uh, as uh, they affect uh, the possibilities of sustaining uh, peace. I also wanted to acknowledge uh, the Peace Building Commission here, the intergovernmental body uh, at the UN that is responsible for um, supporting uh, individual member states uh, and regions who are interested in their uh, assistance to consolidate and sustain peace. They also have become increasing actors in the climate security field. Last year, there were several uh, meetings focused on the nexus between climate security and, and peace building. Uh, one on the Pacific Islands, there has also been work done in this respect um, with the African Union, talking about the Sahel and, and so forth. Um, precisely in terms of the African Union, there is uh, every year a, a dialogue between the Peace Building Commission and the AUPSC. And last year, this took place in November. And the focus was indeed uh, the issue of climate security on uh, the continent. Um, so I was participating in that, very happy to do that. And one of the things that I did uh, focus on and underscore, and I'm sure again, this is a topic that will come up uh, in the course of, of, your, of your discussions. Uh, I emphasize quite a bit the importance of inclusion as well. The fact that um, uh, these uh, adverse effects of climate change are disproportionately affecting um, certain parts of the population. Uh, and also some of the actors on ground that are the most, or let's say the best placed to uh, support uh, appropriate and effective policies are the ones that are often excluded from uh, decision-making and, and from having their perspectives heard. And of course, in so many countries, this often includes women that are not part of the conversation, that are not part of decision-making on, uh, on these issues, uh, young people and various other marginalized groups. So we need to make sure that when we are looking at um, trying to address climate security challenges, that inclusion is one of the first uh, issues that we, uh, we take into account, making sure that it's a very inclusive uh, process. Um, I think I will, uh, I will wrap up so that we have more time for um, uh, the uh, very important information we'll be getting from our drafters, as well as from the practitioners, and then also allow time for hopefully a robust uh, Q&A. So let me just uh, finalize by saying that um, here at PBSO, we were so pleased to have invested in this particular initiative and to have such strong partnerships with really key actors in this emerging field of climate peace and security, whom we've named a moment ago. And I really hope that we'll be able to continue uh, to first of all, build on the finding, findings and recommendations of this thematic review with all of you and continue to strengthen our partnerships in the area of climate security in the coming years, because as we see increasingly uh, every day, this is becoming more and more of an urgent topic in the most fragile and conflict affected countries where we are working. And it is an increasing clamor from our member states to support them in combating this additional very serious conflict trigger. Thank you so much. And I really wish you good deliberations and a great exchange this morning. Thanks. Uh, many thanks, uh, Elizabeth. Uh,
uh, great to kick us off and remind us not only of the work that the PBF is financing, but also of the Peace Building Commission and the other elements uh, where policy and, and priorities are being debated. Uh, maybe just to underline one aspect of something you said, uh, you mentioned the projects that we've done in recent years uh, through 16 entities. Just to recognize, you know, we often say PBF did this or PBF did that. Of course, the PBF didn't do this or that. The PBF financed it. We're a fund. And it's the agencies, funds, and programs across the UN system, as well as NGOs, both international and national, are the ones who really did the work. So we're highlighting, of course, FAO today and FAO and UNICEF were part of the study. So that's wonderful. UNDP, IOM, UN Women, UNFPA, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Many agencies are involved in all this, and indeed part of the purpose of the fund is to incentivize more agencies to get engaged in peace building and to work together in a coherent way. So I just, you know, for many of you, I'm sure uh, representatives of all of those organizations are online today, and I, I just wanted to recognize that, of course, it's your work um, that really makes it happen on the ground. Uh, we're, we're privileged uh, to manage the, the fund that hopefully uh, provides the resources to help make it happen. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to turn to the presentation of the report now from our two uh, lead researchers and just to take a moment to introduce them. Uh, Dr. Erica Gaston is the Senior Policy Advisor and Head of the Conflict Prevention and Sustaining Peace Program at the UN uh, University's Center for Policy Research. Her expertise lies in local peace building and conflict resolution, particularly the rule of law, land conflict and reform, security sector reform, and civilian protection. Uh, field experience on these subjects in Afghanistan, Iraq, Yemen, Syria, Pakistan, among uh, many others. And she's also a non-resident scholar at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Global Public Policy Institute in Berlin. Wonderful, and thank you for being here. Uh, second presenter, Oliver Brown, uh, is an associate fellow with the Chatham House, which is the Royal Institute of International Affairs, as well as at the Geneva Center for Security Policy, where he is also uh, influencing the minds of the next generation, in particular on aspects related to non-traditional threats to security. He's a member of the Climate and Security Expert Network, serves as a trustee for the Conflict and Environment Observatory between 2014 and 2018, based in Kenya, uh, coordinating uh, the UN Environment Program's work uh, on minimizing risks and impacts of disasters and industrial accidents, as well as armed conflicts. Uh, and between 2010 and 2012, uh, Oliver worked for uh, what was then the Department of Political Affairs on Natural Resource Management uh, as an advisor in Sierra Leone to the special representative of the secretary general. So uh, very uh, lucky to have had the two of you working on this research and uh, uh, also uh, grateful for your time uh, today. And with that, uh, Erica and Ollie, uh, the floor is yours. Wonderful, thank you so much for the kind introduction and also for those uh, wonderful thoughts kicking us off for the discussion. Um, just to go ahead and share our screen. So we've got the presentation queued up. Um, just to add on and build off of what some of the previous speakers were saying, of course, this is a thematic review of PBF supported projects of PBOF, PBSO efforts within climate security and peace building. And so it's a way to take stock of those efforts over the last five years. But in many ways, what I think is more interesting about this report and for our discussion today is that it's an opportunity to take stock of what's been happening in this emerging field. As we've been going around doing the interviews for this over the last year, myself, Ali, and also a number of team members not represented here today, we kept hearing, oh, well, this is a very new field. You know, there aren't necessarily cohered best practices. It's still growing and emerging what we should do. And so a large value that we see from this report is just assessing, OK, we've identified that climate does have risks, that it does create vulnerabilities. What are the ways that we're trying to address them as a peace building community, not just the PBF, but all of these other actors? And what are we seeing in terms of emerging lessons learned? How can we do to build from that? And so that's what we really try and get at in this report. As the speakers introduced, we had a subsample of PBF projects over the last um, five years to look at, in addition to interviews with experts and practitioners. 
Um, and these included those with a specific nexus to climate as well as other environmental peace building. So there were 74 projects that we looked at across 33 countries. The largest bulk of them were in West Africa and Central Africa. But as you can see, there's been expanding work on this in a number of other regions of the world. Because this thematic review was specifically trying to learn lessons about climate security, we took that sample of 74 projects and tried to particularly hone in on those that had a particular nexus with climate. That is to say, they really identified ways that climate was contributing to sources of violence or was alternately um, exacerbating existing vulnerabilities. And we're trying to do something about that as well. And so we took from this larger sample of 74, we identified 43 projects that span 22 countries that really did have this environmental focus, uh, or sorry, climate security focus within them. Um, and within that, many of them had specific focus additionally on climate change mitigation or adaptation, although this was not the case in all of them. You can see from this map, this is where a lot more of the climate security work was actually happening in the number of projects. Um, to give you a sense of what the content of those projects were, you know, we can't get into 43 projects in this short presentation, but I think our three case studies give a pretty good sense of what the range of them was. Um, first and foremost, we had the case study in the Lataco Gorma subregion of Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger. And all of the projects in this region focused on the issue of transhumance, which is reflective of the whole of the sample as a whole. More than 50% of our projects focused on transhumance dynamics. And by that, for those of you not familiar, what I mean is that um, so changing rainfall and weather patterns um, have decreased available pasture land in many countries in the last few years and led to changes in this you know, generational pattern of seasonal migration known as transhumance. This has more frequently brought herders into tensions with farmers, leading to, in some case, outbreaks of violent conflict. In addition, because transhumance accounts for some 50% of GDP in some of these countries, it's a key economic practice. And so as this practice is threatened, and also as climate change erodes or affects other food sources, it creates the potential for tremendous vulnerability among large parts of the population. And so what were the projects doing to respond to this complex crisis? They tended to take an integrated approach. So they tended to try to address some of the natural resource scarcity by working to improve pasture land, improve water access points, or support alternative livelihoods or, or agriculture practices. But they also then worked on the human side of the conflict and the ways that you might try to strengthen dispute resolution or border management or governance, or perhaps try to address some of the ways that youth were particularly impacted by these changing transhumance dynamics or by other threats in the region. The second case study that we looked at was in Yemen, and it really focused on um, responding to local water scarcity and conflict together with local governance and tribal dynamics. Um, you know, many, many of the projects in the sample looked at water scarcity and conflict, but Yemen is maybe an acute example of how this interacts with some of the conflict and security dynamics. So Yemen has long been one of the water scores, most water scarce countries in the world in part due to changes in rainfall and other climatic changes, but also due to issues with governance and some blockages at a local level, which have only gotten worse over the last eight years of conflict. So in Yemen, the case study looked at two projects that were run by IOM and FAO, which worked to, with communities to address this full landscape of climate security dynamics. So similar to the Liptako Gorma projects, they did provide technical assistance. So working on rehabilitating irrigation ditches, improving well water systems and usage. But then they also worked on some of the communal sources and blockages, notably the ways that tribal or community disputes were affecting access and management. And so in these projects, communities and local authorities worked jointly to resolve water disputes and then to come up with new compacts for sharing water and access. And perhaps most interesting about these projects is that really in many ways they were kicked off by a group of women, a group of women in Sanaa who were seeing these tribal conflicts that were blocking access to an important water source and said, if we were enabled to facilitate and sort of unlock that dispute, we could improve water access and management for the community. And so even beyond that initial pilot that happened in Sanaa, 
all of the different areas where these projects were implemented, women were integrated in the water dispute resolution process and with significant value added to the project. The final case study that we looked at um, was in the Pacific Islands, which has been mentioned before. This is a project that was implemented by UNDP in partnership with IOM, and in, it was focused on the existential threat that climate change poses to island nations. So a very different type of climate security dynamic than some of the others we've talked about. And in many ways, this was unique among the PBF climate security projects. For example, it it worked with communities to support their ability to advocate on a global stage about this existential threat. However, it also did include some projects that were more common across the whole sample, and that is, for example, supporting community climate change adaptation and future planning. Um, there are, of course, this is only a sample of projects that I've offered. The, you know, full 43 involved so many different um, scenarios and types of climate security. There was a big focus on it, looking at women's role in community climate change adaptation. Quite a few projects looked at youth and how natural resource issues or climatic changes were affecting their vulnerability and opportunities. There were a couple that even looked specifically at climate change mitigation, for example, through forest and biodiversity protection. Um, so I won't get into all of these. Perhaps we can get into the more of them in question and answer. But for now, I'll turn to Ali to do some of our to share some of our key findings. Thank you so much, Erica. I mean, there's an awful lot more in the report, but what I wanted to do, I guess, is just focus in on three broad 60,000 foot kind of findings that we had from this research. And the first is that, I guess, you know, greater investments in this climate related or environmental peace building uh, has tremendous promise. Um, you know, by combining peace building tools with the ability to contribute to sources of natural re resource scarcity and associated vulnerabilities kind of gets to the heart of what many communities view as their most pressing concerns. So food insecurity, unequal access to critical livelihoods, uh, critical resources or, or lack of uh, of livelihoods. And, and, you know, even in the most war-torn, highly politicized conflicts, what we found is at a local level, it's often fights over land, water and other environmental resources that are the most, you know, among the most frequent drivers of conflict. So this, broadly, this whole area is really getting to the heart of some really important conflict drivers. And it has a, a potentially transformative impact while at the same time offering the potential to uh, you know, facilitate climate change adaptation at a local level. So that's the first kind of key finding. I, I, I guess the second one is that um, it's it's not just this this type of programming is is possible in even the most fragile and conflict affected environments, but that also that it's perhaps the most likely to show dividends. Um, so I mean, as we all know, these conflict affected uh, fragile environments can be really hard to access. There are challenges in developing, implementing, sustaining projects. And so often donors uh, favor safer places for their funding. But by most measures of climate change vulnerability, the worst affected areas are in fragile conflict affected states. Um, and so these are the places where we would expect the most serious climate security implications as a rule. But a study of, of some of the climate finance vertical funds across 156, 46 countries found that only one of the top 15 re recipients was ranked extremely fragile. So the PBF programming kind of runs counter to this trend, is that it's leaning into programming in some really difficult environments. So nine of the 10 countries with the most funding um, uh, of among our sample were among the most vulnerable countries to climate change. And of the 10 that received the most funding, six consistently rank amongst the most fragile states in the fragile states index. And then eight countries were receiving fund funding while experiencing uh, active armed conflict at quite a, a quite a high level. So I think this PBF kind of portfolio shows us firstly that it's possible to do this kind of programming, even in the most difficult environments, um, and that it's not only possible, but it can be amongst the most useful types of programming in these areas. Um, so in countries like Yemen, Somalia, parts of the Sahel, um, aid to local communities is often shut off due to access or because it's viewed as too political or, or conflictual. Um, but, you know, in many situations, 
addressing some of these core natural resource drivers of conflict um, can be seen or, or can be is both welcomed by local communities and it gets to the heart of their daily concerns as well as the local conflict drivers that they have. So it it tends to be possible to work on these issues even when the space for other types of engagements are closed. Um, and so we recognize that you know while resolving these natural resource issues and conflicts does not necessarily address the larger conflict within countries. Um, it can create the space for the sort of bottom up peace building that is a really necessary uh, ingredient for conflict transformation. So, um, you know, Erica was talking about the, the project in Yemen, um, you know, that that water infrastructure project did not resolve the larger conflict, but it helped to um, it helped to, to be a necessary piece of the puzzle. And, and is a crucial way of starting to rebuild um, communities wracked by conflict. So the the final point, um, the, the, my third point is that this kind of programming offers entry points on other peace building goals, as, as Erica was talking about also, and was Ms. Speha was talking about, is that they're not just important at addressing these crucial natural resource drivers of conflict. Um, you know, they're welcomed by communities, they can operate in some of the, the toughest spaces, but they can also offer entry points for addressing other peace building priorities. And what we, we saw this repeatedly in some of our interviews and in our work. Um, some of those we interviewed talk about this from the standpoint of technical diplomacy. They could come into communities bringing technical skills or assets uh, to improve agriculture, address pastoral infrastructure, local water supply, but by engaging through those technical issues, by building trust, they could then um, you know, build on some other community or governance practices that were also contributing to the natural resource issue and the conflict. Um, by you know, uh, building into communal trust, you know, addressing some issues around elite capture or other kind of core aspects of governance. So, you know also by addressing structural inequalities and barriers against certain groups. So Erica was talking about the Yemeni project, and it's a really good example of this. It wasn't per se a women's empowerment project, but it did achieve substantial progress in this regard. Um, and that's even in a country that is routinely rated as amongst the lowest in, in terms of women's equality with substantial barriers to participation. So this area of the link between gender, climate and security is is very new um, and you know more investments need to be made but I think there's already evidence that the integration of some of these inclusion elements as Ms. Behar was, was saying with these natural resource issues could be a really important area to invest in in future uh, and with that let me turn back to Erica to take us through some of the lessons learned Wonderful. Thank you, Ali. Uh, yeah, so just to offer to kick us off, hopefully we'll get to more recommendations in the conclusions. Um, but we saw, I mean, number one recommendation, just given everything Ali said, was, you know, to encourage further investment in the climate security and environmental peace building space, because this can be really transformative. It's crucial because of the climate situation we're in, but it also has enormous potential to advance other peace building goals. So that's our number one recommendation. But there are ways that not just PBF, but other donors, the field as a whole, could be more strategic about how they're doing that in a way that might encourage further best practices and synergies to emerge in this field. One starting point would be to have a clearer definition of what PBSO considers to be a climate security project. This doesn't mean, of course, ceasing support for all of the other types of environmental peace building. These complement climate related work and also have the potential for a transformative impact. However, being clear on what we consider to be climate security projects, what they may make it easier to identify and nurture best practices in several ways. First, a more focused definition, still broad but not unlimited, might help PBSO to steer funding towards promising practices or needed interventions, for example, through its particular priority windows. Um, it would also help to ensure that climate related language doesn't become just window dressing, but that it's really synced into the project. How might it do that? For example, if we could more clearly identify what the climate security issue was in a project, we might then be able to ask whether the activities proposed were fit for purpose, um, whether they had the prospect of contributing to addressing those climate security issues, and in that way, steering projects towards greater impact and coherency. 
A complement to this would be to improve the focus and clarity within the projects themselves. So for all of the practitioners out there, being able to identify within a proposed project how exactly the natural resource or climate related components fit in with some of the other peace building goals and vice versa, and what the key priorities are within a project. Doing that might make it easier for us to be able to identify the connections or synergies within these complex integrated projects and also improve any evaluation and learning. And then a step beyond this project level would be to um, think more strategically across the field, so among different donors and practitioners. One of PBS's goals, SO's goals, for example, is to have a catalytic effect, to be able to test approaches within this emerging field, to see project models that other donors or the governments themselves might take up and scale more broadly. And we did see a lot of evidence of that happening with the projects we looked at. But many of those we suggested that talked to suggested this could be even broader if there was a way to sort of have connective tissue, create a pipeline for projects to kind of more strategically be developed. And that might mean more conversations or partnerships among different climate donors to ensure that the sort of projects being nurturing fit into and can be scaled up appropriately. And establishing such connections might also help by introducing promising projects to donors earlier in the project cycle. So that could be a result in more seamless transitions for them to be picked up. It also might create strategic linkages with other governance, peace building, or particularly climate change adaptation activities. Um, so the PBF projects that did have climate change adaptation components, we saw that they would have realized an even larger impact if they had been linked up to some broader climate governance and development efforts. The second major kind of basket of recommendations we have relates specifically to some of this peace building efforts to, to push this climate security and environmental programming into fragile context and also related to some of the cross border approaches. Um, and the overall recommendation was number one, that this is a really, really fruitful area to invest in within conflict affected and fragile states, and it's possible. But to keep that going, you do need to have a very flexible adaptive funding mechanisms, which the PBF has definitely been a leader on. So continuing that. Um, another challenging issue, a little bit harder for the PBF, is to maybe think about extending the timeline or duration of projects. So programming in conflict and fragile affected spaces can be really fraught, tends to run into a lot of implementation delays, but also if you have a longer runtime, it's more likely that you're gonna see some of the benefits of the transformative components. So changing local practices or governance structures may take even more time in these fragile contexts. PBF projects usually run for about two years. Some donors are a little bit longer, but usually not terribly longer. Um, so if we really want to think about investing in these environments, we might have to think about extending that average project timeline or at least the startup period in these fragile contexts. Um, that same recommendation about improving, you know, extending the timelines would also apply for some of the emerging approaches to build cross-border or regional programming. Uh, these are really, really crucial within the climate security field. I mean, obviously, many of what many of these climate issues are fundamentally transnational problems. And so it's helpful to have coordinated transnational responses. But it's important to recognize that anytime you have a cross-border project, it's more complex to implement. It often takes more time both to start up and then to actually realize the synergies or the benefits between what's happening in the different countries on this. Um, so more time is definitely valuable. In addition, because there are these extra costs, so it's harder to implement cross-border projects, we really want to be making sure to have that extra layer of scrutiny to ensure that there is an added value to taking a cross-border approach. So not just the same activities happening on other sides, you know, both sides of the border, but how much is it really going to be um, building from contributing to the theory of change and contributing to the actual objectives? And then in addition, within at least some of the cross-border projects, and perhaps we can get into this more in the question and answer, we may want to think a little bit more about a stronger emphasis on political engagement. So a lot of the cross-border projects within the PBF fund we've looked at 
Um, they would have a couple of meetings between government officials on either side of the border, but they would tend to be sort of two or three activities in the scope of a two year project. A lot of experts we spoke to who worked on larger environmental peace building projects, so transboundary water issues, for example, would say that it needs to be a much more dedicated effort, you know, maybe five years in which you're really, really working with government officials on both sides. So that additional lens might be important for developing this line of work going forward. And then the final basket, and then I'll leave off for some more lessons learned from some of our other practitioners, um, would be how do we invest in learning and innovation in this new space? Um, and, and this is really important because even though we saw a lot of positive results within the 74 projects, there's definitely still um, room to be nurturing best practices and finding out what are the best models to respond to this. So one issue was that some of the projects we looked at they were trying to think about climate, but it was still only at a superficial level. They might have some form of green jobs or green energy component, or it might be talked about in the conflict analysis, but then not really seen through in the theory of change or in the actual project activities. It wasn't really integrated in a transformative way. And the best way to address this is to give, uh, there's a couple ways to address it. One is to give more projects the space to experiment and test this. And you could do that through a greater emphasis on iterative programming or through cross case learning. We were already seeing some of this, um, for example, within the gender climate security space, although some of the projects didn't necessarily hadn't fully realized the synergy between goals related to women's empowerment and those related to climate. There was a new crop of projects that had come out of the 2021 funding cycle that were really explicitly trying to test how these two goals could be interrelated and advance the other. And we're trying to test not only what are the results of combining these in one peace building project, but how do they play out in different areas? How do we learn where to, to apply these and where to take the lessons? And so that sort of explicit testing approach would be really important across a number of issue areas. Um, in addition to that, the last kind of broader recommendation, and then I'll leave off, um, would also to be think about these projects from a longer time frame. So many of the projects that we're talking about are adopting theories of change that would only show dividends over many years. We talked about this a little bit in the introduction, the important focus on addressing inequity, on addressing inclusion. All of those things are very slow burning strategies that only come to pass after many years. Even if you're talking about the simple technical inputs, it takes time for climate change adaptation practices to take root or for sustainable livelihoods to, to really come to fruition. And so when we are talking about how to realize the impact from these projects, one, uh, and this is, I guess, a message more to donors in this space, is that there may be a need to right-size expectations about when we will see impact in these projects. And hint would be that it will not be in two years. And then the second, for us practitioners as a learning community, we should be seeing more investment in longitudinal or cross-case studies. Um, I'll leave it that. We could get into more of these recommendations at a later point, but we're coming right up at our timeline. And I want to be sure to have inputs from our three other speakers who are bringing really valuable lessons for the field. So thank you. Great. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, we are running a few minutes behind, so I think what I'll do is introduce the panelist and go straight to the speaker. So rather than introducing all the panel and then asking a question, I'll just uh, go straight, introduce and ask a question. And if I could ask the panelists to try and keep it to closer to uh, to five or six minutes uh, rather than six or seven, uh, that would be great. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, Mohamed Fadiga. Uh, he's a resilience specialist for the Sahel and the West Africa region for FAO. Uh, Mr. Fadiga has been supporting FAO programming, monitoring evaluation uh, since 2016 in Guinea and Mali, as well as in the regional office in Dakar. He's also a regional facilitator for the West and Central Africa uh, Capacity Disaster Reduction Initiative. Uh, it's a partnership and, and also looking at Cameroon and Senegal. Uh, and is directly linked uh, to many of the nexus uh, efforts um, that are underway these days, humanitarian development peace net nexus uh, efforts. 
and is integrated with UNIS, the United Nations Integrated Strategy for the Sahel. Uh, Fadiga, we would like to pick your brain a little bit about climate security programming at the cross-border or regional level. So Erica was just talking about how important that is. Uh, it's also a little bit uh, challenging. Can you tell us a little bit about the regional approach from FAO uh, in West Africa and the Sahel? Uh, and based on your experience, uh, including interventions supported by the PBF, uh, any good practice examples uh, that some of the 150 people or so online today uh, can take away uh, and integrate into their programming. So, Fadiga, uh, uh, say à vous la parole. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. I do appreciate the way you pronounce my name. It is perfectly said, and uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you uh, for for really the big opportunity given to FAO through me, but also with all the colleagues uh, that work. Uh, on the same team, especially the Professor Usubi Toure, who's uh, currently connected. I, I really need to recognize his hard work on everything that is done within this framework. As it was before mentioned, and I'm part of FAO's Resilience and Emergency uh, uh, team based in Dakar, and our team covers West Africa and the Sahel. Such geographical cover from uh, our office is not fortuitous or casual. It is based on the existence of regional dynamics that are conditioned by culture, economy, nature itself, naming livelihoods and, uh, and of course, history between communities and countries. Evidence that have been gathered along the past decades have shown that livelihoods in the Sahel, for example, are both a country and a regional commonwealth. The example of transportable Transboundary waters that have been mentioned here, it is key to illustrate the need for a regional cross-border programmatic approach. In this regard, for example, in the Sahel, under the UNIS, the United Nations Integrated Strategy for the Sahel, water has been selected as an accelerator for development, which, uh, which uh, gives the importance of considering uh, these transboundary uh, waters within the cross-border approach. So in this regard, on the basis of the continuous analysis that is done at regional uh, level, FO has set up and implemented a programmatic uh, cross-border approach that integrates uh, interconnected food crises that, that are confirmed, of course, year after year. And if you check the latest data from the CAD Harmonisé, more than 45 million people are currently affected in the Sahel region. In this context, uh, conflicts and climate change appear as the main causes and amplifier of the food, food crisis in the region. Uh, for this regard, for, for, for this reason, we have really focused our uh, our work on three main areas. The two first are the Liptakogurma that have been mentioned and as well as the Lake Chad Basin due to the outbreak of conflict of conflict and violence. Right now I'm currently talk to, talking to you from 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 um, from Burkina Faso where on a field mission we are working to, towards really uh, localizing aid to address the conflicts uh, in in areas where uh, many actors cannot be present, but communities and others are present and through which we can really achieve big, uh, uh, big elements. And finally, the third region is the coastal country due to the con conflict spillover from the north. So we are con we have been considering these three main areas. So uh, um, we've we've carried out a learning process, of course, uh, within FAO on PBF projects to really uh, see how we work and how we can we can really even better the work that we're doing. In this in this regard, uh, we our our main well, our main work is done through emergency resilience and development projects uh, that that contributes to peace, but above all, that fully value the efforts that it that the opportunities and efforts that are given by PBF. On this basis, we have uh, we have really cited uh, that most of our intervention go around relation between host and displaced person, rural employment, support for rural livelihoods, natural resources management, which have been mentioned before, reintegrations, and so forth. Now, this goes uh, with respecting a few good practices or principle also that we have we are really integrated and embedded in our approach. The first one being the analysis of the structural causes and interconnected drivers of conflicts. Why? 
to better identify the relevance of interventions and contribute effectively, effectively to strengthening the peace component within the HDP nexus. These have been mentioned by, by, by colleagues prior to me in, really to, in, in order to really identify the most relevant interventions. The second one, also directly linked to the key finding one, is rather than focusing on mitigating the socioeconomic consequences of conflicts, we really focus on dealing with their deep socio-political causes. For example, through strengthening the inclusion of actors in access to natural resources, in decision making, in uh, in all of these elements that are also directly linked to the factor mentioned by the uh, Assistant Director, Secretary General, uh, in terms of inclusion. And the last. Uh, the last element would be to, to seek to meet the challenges of achieving lasting results in terms of uh, contributing to the sustainability of peace that have been generated by the projects. What happens after the projects? What is the dynamics that is created through the project in order to have sustainability in results, change of dynamics, which is achieved at individual level, at institution, institutional level, uh, through the commitment of governments? Now, when it comes to, to, to the link between climate risk, BBF intervention is in the region, we have had, we have analyzed several interventions that we carry out in Niger, in Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire, Mali, Sierra Leone, and it has made, this has made it possible for us to see where are the, what are the, 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 the good practices or activities that give significant uh, local peace dividends through reducing the, the, the factors of conflict or strengthening the factors of peace. In particular, these can be, uh, it could be the constructions of hydraulic facilities to increase water sources for domestic needs and livestock's watering. This is one element. You also have the rehabilitation of degraded pastoral land and coming after that one, the delimitations and making of transhumance corridors. These two or three elements are key and paramount when it comes to farmer herders conflicts uh, that are affect that are also affected by the dynamics in our in our region, whether it is the Lake Chad Basin or the or the or the Litako Gurma, which is already affected by conflicts and can have a bigger influence from different groups. And to and to to go, there is also the support for the promotion of sustainable and productive agriculture. Yes. Just want to go <laughs> to finalize with the last one. I'm just uh, 45 seconds in, um, which is strengthening the capacities of vulnerable groups so that they can play an active role in public space. Capacity building is key, and this has been really pointed out as a main, a main uh, uh, good practice that we implement in the project that give us higher dividends. So, uh, dear Brian, dear colleagues, thank you. I think I've come to the to the to the finale of my pre, of my interventions. Best regards to all colleagues. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fadiga. That's great. And uh, of course, we wish we had more time. Uh, colleagues, the Q and A uh, box is open. So if you want to hear more from anybody um, after I rudely cut them off, uh, you can uh, put it in the question mark and uh, hear more from your uh, favorite presenter. Let me uh, move to Aliu Traore. Uh, Aliu is a conflict management and peace building expert with over 14 years of experience focusing on root causes of conflict, uh, preventing and countering violent extremism. Uh, with Mercy Corps, uh, he worked on uh, peace building and governance in Mali from 2016 to 2022. Uh, governance, uh, CVE, peace building, uh, support to justice and resilience. Uh, before Mercy Corps, uh, he was working with the Norwegian Refugee Council as a negotiation and mediation expert, and also with Search for Common Ground as a program director and country representative. Uh, he's currently working as the deputy chief of party of uh, Nafure, if I pronounced it uh, right, I'm not sure I did. Uh, it's a youth uh, countering violent extremism program uh, with an organization called Counterpart International in Mauritania. He's worked uh, all across uh, West and Central Africa, Ivory Coast, Mali, Burkina, uh, Congo, Central African Republic, uh, and also in uh, Haiti. Uh, so uh, a tremendous amount of experience with a wide range of NGO partners. Uh, I want to be on record as noting uh, often NGO partners are far ahead of us in the United Nations. We have a lot to learn from. Uh, uh, far beyond uh, being implementers, it's far more important your innovation and your leadership in, in many of these areas that uh, we do our best to try and learn from. So thank you so much for being here and uh, Alio, five, six minutes, uh, over to you. 
Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Brian. I'm going to switch in, in French. It's going to be easier for me. Uh, uh, thank you. Merci beaucoup pour cette uh, uh, belle introduction. Et, et justement, uh, me concernant, je voudrais partager l'expérience que nous avons eue avec Mercicor uh, dans le travail effectué uh, dans le Liptako Gourmand. Et pour rappel, uh, pour rappel, uh, le projet que nous avons appelé Appui aux initiatives locales de paix est une expérience pilote. Euh, avec le, le, le PBF Fonds pour voir dans quelle mesure on peut mettre en avant euh, l'approche communautaire, les initiatives locales qui sont soutenues par les communautés, de sorte à ce que euh, nous, en tant que Merci Corps, à l'époque, on puisse les appuyer, les accompagner. Et dans cette approche-là, l'idée, c'était de vraiment euh, essayer d'avoir une approche nouvelle, flexible, pour aller chercher des acteurs qui ne bénéficient pas forcément euh, des financements classiques, euh, euh, des, des, des bailleurs de fonds, pour pouvoir concrétiser leurs idées de projet, parce que euh, les conflits et la violence sont leur quotidien, et ils ont leur solution, ils ont leur approche, et malheureusement, euh, dans le cas des financements classiques, ces acteurs-là n'ont pas la possibilité de mettre en œuvre leur, leurs idées. Et ce projet AILP, justement, voulait euh, essayer cette approche-là pour voir dans quelle mesure on peut leur faire confiance et leur permettre de pouvoir euh, exercer, mettre en œuvre, concrétiser leur, leur, leurs idées. Et ce programme, c'est dans le plateau gourmand, donc le Mali, le Burkina Faso et le Niger. On remarquera que ce sont des zones à, 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 à forte tension en termes de violence. Et alors, l'autre expérience pratique, euh, nous a permis d'identifier, je dirais, autour de 75 organisations locales. Euh, C'est soit des associations de jeunes, des associations de femmes, des organisations religieuses, euh, des organisations socio-professionnelles. On a, on a parlé de la question d'agro, euh, de, de transhumance. On a des initiatives qui sont venues d'associations d'éleveurs et d'agriculteurs ensemble, euh, qui sont au cœur de leurs problématiques. Donc, ça nous a permis d'avoir au moins 75 acteurs euh, diversifiés dans les, dans, les, dans les trois pays pour pouvoir euh, bénéficier de leur, de, leur, de leur idée de projet. Alors, justement, pour pouvoir travailler avec ce type d'acteurs, il faut avoir un système de financement flexible euh, pour pouvoir justement s'adapter à, 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 à ces idées. Et on a eu des, des, des idées de projet qui tournent autour de, de trois ou quatre thématiques essentielles. On a d'abord la question de, 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 des ressources naturelles, de l'accès à l'eau de l'accès à l'eau et de la question foncière. Et ça, c'est clairement ressorti ici. Euh, il y a aussi euh, l'inclusion de groupes marginalisés. Et par groupes marginalisés, on a eu des, des idées de projets qui sont venues des femmes qui n'ont pas généralement dans certaines cultures le droit ou bien la possibilité de pouvoir discuter des questions foncières. Donc, des idées de projets sont venues de ces, de ces femmes, de ces jeunes, et souvent d'associations de personnes handicapées également. Et puis, justement, au-delà de cela, il y a les thématiques autour de la gouvernance inclusive pour que tous ces acteurs-là puissent prendre part à la prise de décision en ce qui concerne les infrastructures locales de paix. Alors, bien entendu, on n'a pas beaucoup de temps, donc je vais aller rapidement sur les leçons apprises et les bonnes pratiques. Et j'étais content, heureux tout à l'heure quand j'écoutais les, 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 les conclusions de cette étude et parce que nous, la première... Euh, le premier constat qu'on a fait, parce qu'on était réticents, c'était un moment donné, quand on a vu la violence dégénérer au niveau de Minaka, quand on a vu la violence dégénérer au niveau du Bouc du Maon, au Burkina Faso, on s'est dit, est-ce que c'est possible de travailler Mais en réalité, c'est possible de travailler dans des zones de violence. Et clairement, ça, c'est le premier constat auquel nous sommes parvenus. On peut travailler à la consolidation de la paix, même dans des zones de violence, à condition de trouver la bonne stratégie, à condition de trouver les bons acteurs, et l'exemple de Menaka, l'exemple de Kossi dans la boucle du Noum, où on a des organisations catholiques qui ont proposé un, un projet qui est, est d'inviter tous les acteurs, toutes les communautés, à comprendre la nature de la violence qui sévit dans cette région du Burkina Faso et à faire la part des choses entre cette violence et ce que les communautés peuvent faire pour renforcer la paix. Et ça, pour nous, ça renforce notre idée de dire qu'effectivement, même dans les conditions les plus difficiles, la paix est possible. Il faut trouver les bons acteurs, il faut trouver la bonne stratégie. Deuxième constat, deuxième leçon que nous avons, que nous avons retenue de cette uh, approche, même si elle est toujours en cours, c'est que tout ce qui est initiative endogène, qui vient des communautaires, 
est beaucoup plus approprié par les communautés et ceci est gage de pérennité. Et ça, on l'a vu tout de suite. Quand c'est des idées qui sont discutées par elles-mêmes, ils trouvent la stratégie de mise en œuvre, qui la mettent en œuvre et justement, il y a une meilleure appropriation et ça permet de pouvoir avoir des effets durables. Et dernier point que je voudrais partager, c'est on a parlé de, dans les résultats, dans les recommandations, euh, nos chercheurs ont dit qu'il fallait beaucoup plus d'implication au niveau des autorités politiques dans les différents pays. Et je pense que nous, on l'a expérimenté euh, dans le cadre de ce projet au Mali de façon spécifique. On a vu que ces dernières années, euh, le gouvernement malien a pris certaines dispositions qui ont changé la manière de travailler des organisations nationales euh, dans le pays. Et pour nous, on a pu mitiger cette réalité grâce au fait que, dès le départ, ces autorités administratives, à la personne du représentant du gouverneur dans chaque région, étaient impliquées dans la sélection des initiatives locales de paix. Donc, le fait de pouvoir impliquer les autorités locales déjà dans la conception des idées de projet permet de pouvoir déjouer un peu les contraintes liées aux exigences de, de l'administration euh, politique. Et cela nous a permis de pouvoir travailler, même si les contraintes se multipliaient de temps en temps, mais nous, on a continué le travail parce qu'ils étaient au cœur de la prise de décision. Donc voilà, en gros, pour ne pas que Brian m'arrête, euh, je vais conclure ici pour dire, voilà les quelques trois points euh, que je voulais partager avec vous. Merci pour votre écoute. Over to you, Brian. Merci, uh, Aliou. Uh, some really important lessons there uh, about access to uh, resources for marginalized groups, about starting locally, uh, involving local authorities, uh, and uh, the, the the possibility of, for us not to be discouraged, the possibility for us to work even in the uh, zones of, uh, of current violence uh, if you choose the right strategy and choose the right uh, actors. So, so some really important lessons coming there. Uh, let me turn to our last uh, panelist, which is uh, Celia Ha. Uh, she's a manager currently of the European Union and UNEP, uh, UN Environment Programme Climate Change and Security Partnership. So very important partnership between the EU and the UN there. Uh, looking at uh, the capacities uh, around environment and security risks, both globally, regionally, and at, uh, and at country level. Prior to this role, uh, Celia worked as a program manager of a joint UNEP, uh, UN Environment Program, UNDP, UN Women, uh, and PBSO program, uh, thank you, uh, which focused on using natural resource uh, management uh, as a tool for promoting political participation. So again, this connection into, into politics and peace building, economic empowerment and protection of women in climate <laughs> conflict uh, affected uh, contexts. Um, thanks, uh, Celia. My question over for you. The, the uh, review recommended that PBF and its partners uh, focus more on pioneering or commended PBF. The review found that we were good at encouraging innovation. Uh, through testing different programmatic approaches, uh, and our, one of those areas is linking to gender, uh, gender equality, uh, peace and security. Uh, we know this is an important and yet still a relatively new uh, field. Uh, what's your view on the current space uh, between gender equality and uh, climate security? Uh, and uh, again, uh, uh, an appeal for any example that you might be able to give us uh, that uh, some of the practitioners can carry away with them. Thanks, over to you. Well, thanks so much, Brian, and, and to all the other panelists. Let me uh, start by congratulating PBSO and, and indeed all the authors of this excellent review. You know, as someone who's been working in this space now for the better part of 15 years, I think it's the first substantive review of climate security practice. Um, so obviously, uh, you know, with a relevant sample size. So obviously the uh, findings and recommendations of the review um, have, you know, relevance for well beyond future PBF projects. I think it's really helpful for all of us um, in the space. So thanks and, and congratulations again. So um, where is the gender, climate and security space at the moment? Um, well, unquestionably, there's been very significant progress on better understanding and addressing both the gendered risks and the unique opportunities for inclusion, as is well highlighted in the review. Um, and certainly at the global level, there is now you know, strong awareness and fairly robust integration, I would say, of the women, peace and security and climate security policy agendas. Um, and as the review points out, this has translated into a greater understanding of linkages at the fields level and a significant growth uh, in programming that seeks to use 
climate security uh, or environmental themes to strengthen women's roles in in various ways. So obviously the PBF has been a very significant engine for this, um, but there are other donors such as the EU as well, um, supporting this kind of work and really supporting uh, the growth of the evidence base. I mean, I think it's worth recognizing in general that many of the member states who've historically championed women, peace and security issues are also the leaders on climate security themes. Uh, they've played a very significant role in, in raising the issues and, 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 and ensuring that they're addressed in various fora, but also in providing the space for innovation, uh, for trial and error and, and for risk taking in general. Now, obviously, there's progress to be made um, at all at all levels. I think that you know the review provides a number of recommendations for for strengthening work on the gender, climate, and security nexus, and I agree with all of them. But let me perhaps highlight two gaps um, in particular. First, I mean, I think it's important to note that what successes have been achieved um, in using climate action to strengthen women's roles in conflict prevention and peace building have been achieved locally. Uh, for now, there's fairly little evidence of local gains translating into state, national, transboundary, or regional level political or peace building processes um, in terms of women's leadership. So we need to do more on uh, studying and establishing these vertical linkages on showing how uh, to leverage entry points um, at these other levels um, as well. And this is one of the things our uh, project in, in Blue Nile together with UNDP and UN Women uh, has been working on. Now, obviously, the situation in Sudan um, is rather uncertain, but hopefully uh, we'll be able to get that back on track. Secondly, there's still a number of, of gaps um, in the evidence base. Most of the examples that are discussed in the review are from contexts where climate change is leading to scarcity of key resources, such as uh, water and fertile land and, you know, ensuing competition for these resources. But we know far less about the gendered impacts and opportunities in contexts where climate change manifests in very different ways, for example, extreme weather events, or where violence takes uh, a different form, criminality, for example. So it's important that we continue to explore and learn from gender, climate and security programming with these different parameters, because we know that this kind of work, um, like all peace building work, is context specific and that good practices from one setting don't automatically translate or apply um, elsewhere, even in context with fairly similar um, uh, parameters. Um, you know, you can get fairly different results. Uh, we have had very successful results in Sudan, for example, that um, have been where practices have been replicated and not translated to as successful results for gender equality and women's empowerment in Côte d'Ivoire. Another area is uh, gender-based violence linked to climate change um, and environmental degradation in, in conflict settings. There are several indications that this is emerging as an extremely worrying trend. Uh, new risks uh, posed by climate change in settings like uh, Somalia and South Sudan, where displacement from climate events has been linked to really egregious cases of sexual violence. So there's a lot, to a lot more to be done and a lot more to be learned from and explored. Um, and we very much hope and encourage uh, the gender, climate and security space uh, remaining a space for, for innovation and risk taking. Um, and finally, I think as it's been pointed out for by, by reviewers, it's really critical that the wealth of knowledge and information on integrated programming that has been accumulated through PBF programming inform climate programming more broadly. Um, so that the conflict risks that stem from climate action uh, can be averted. This is obviously true for you know, the risks uh, involved with scaling climate adaptation, and there are many opportunities to support women's leadership here, but also, um, and importantly, uh, for important for mitigation, which could generate new risks for local and regional peace and security with very negative impacts on women and girls. Think about you know, mining for critical minerals, for example. Um, so turning now now to your to your second question on on concrete good practices for for practitioners, I think a number of the good practices that were developed in our early work um, are happily now fairly routine elements of gender, climate, and security programming. I could talk about the need for intersectional analysis of natural resource use, access, and control. Uh, careful process design in which women are given the space to guide on how to address structural and social barriers or the importance of strategically sequencing project activities or, or components. But since the review recognizes that gender, climate, and security projects have typically been spaces for innovation, let me perhaps highlight a new uh, progress, uh, a new practice, sorry, that aims to improve 
the integration of uh, conflict prevention, climate um, action and peace building with a particular uh, focus on, on gender. So in our project, uh, the, the project I mentioned earlier um, in Blue Nile, Sudan, as well as in a project in Cote d'Ivoire, we're piloting uh, a new approach to local integrated gender climate and security assessments that combine geospatial data analysis of climate trends uh, with locally collected environmental socioeconomic, including gender, uh, and conflict data. So there's a lot of an analysis of climate security risks out there, but much of it is at regional or national scale, and it's not always very helpful to identify risks or opportunities at local scale. So the idea is to develop a model of locally contextualized analysis that could and should be conducted by project staff as part of baseline analysis. It's a way of sort of standardizing um, approaches to understanding the intersections of these issues um, and um, identification of entry points for action. So concretely, we're trying to show how political analysts or gender experts can use available climate data and tools to more accurately describe current climate conditions, uh, but also project future changes, um, as well as interpret what that means for local gender and identity groups. Um, so it's not without challenges. Uh, we could go into that, <laughs> we don't have time. Um, but the hope is that including this kind of analysis of future risks um, also helps to bridge the catalytic actions of the PBF, which address kind of immediate needs, um, foster inclusion and, and strengthen local mechanisms and institutions with longer term actions at scale, uh, for example, on, on climate adaptation. Um, so I, I'll stop here for now. I know we're running out of time and happy to take your questions. Thanks. Fantastic. Uh, thank you. Uh, super interesting and, and important work. Uh, OK, this is where being virtual and spread all over the world is tricky. Uh, we have about 15 minutes. Uh, we got three presenters, uh, two presenters and three panelists. That's five. 15 divided by five is three. So what I propose, I hope you can all see the questions that are in the Q&A. A head nod, yes, no. If you click on the Q&A button, if you're on Teams, you'll be able to see the questions in the right. Uh, uh, what I propose is to go through the three panelists in the same order. So uh, Fadiga, Aliu, and Celia, and then back to Oliver and then to Erica. Some of the questions in the chat are sort of indicated for people, and I'll try and suggest uh, a, a bit uh, an angle uh, as, we, um, as we go. Uh, is that a good game plan? Yes, uh, Fadiga, are you still there? I don't see your camera. Assuming you're still there. I think Fadiga has been having some technical issues, so he's trying to reconnect right now. Okay, Fadiga's not there. Aliu, are you still there? Yeah. Uh, great, thanks. There were a couple of questions uh, in the box uh, about dealing with non-state uh, armed groups. And uh, as you were talking about working in the uh, areas uh, with ongoing violence, maybe you could say a word or two about how you manage the interactions in those environments with non-state armed groups. And, and then a question I have also, since you've worked quite a bit on preventing violent extremism, what's the connection with violent extremism? Is there one uh, and, and climate security? Have you had to address that directly or 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 not so a couple of questions for for uh, two or three minutes <laughs> un petit défi uh, uh, je, je vais commencer par uh, par la dernière question le lien qu'on peut trouver sur la question du climat sécurité peace building et la question de prévention de l'extrémisme violent je pense que il y a un lien qui est qui est clair quand on se réfère à la question des jeunes, euh, on a parlé tout à l'heure de gouvernance inclusive, d'implication des jeunes dans la prise de décision au niveau de la gouvernance locale et même dans la prise de décision en ce qui concerne la résolution des conflits communautaires. Alors, ce que nous avons vu, euh, disons, il y a quelques années, quand au niveau de Mercico, on a essayé de comprendre quels sont les mobiles qui peuvent qui peut pousser les jeunes à rejoindre les groupes extrémistes violents, il y a une idée qui est ressortie qui est que, c'est vrai, il y a les questions économiques, il y a les questions de vulnérabilité, mais ce qui est ressorti, 
et qui nous a, a qui a attiré notre attention, c'est que souvent, ce n'est pas les questions économiques, ce n'est pas les questions de vulnérabilité, mais ce sont les communautés elles-mêmes qui poussent les jeunes à rejoindre les groupes armés pour que les communautés puissent en tirer des dividendes pour leur propre sécurité. Et ça, ça résout clairement les questions de, de, de sécurité et de, de changement climatique. Parce que justement, on sait que certains groupes armés, euh, justement, notamment les éleveurs euh, et même les agriculteurs, souvent, ils, 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 je ne sais pas comment dire, ils monnaient leur euh, proximité avec tel groupe armé ou tel autre groupe armé pour qu'en retour, on puisse leur assurer l'accès aux ressources locales, l'accès aux points d'eau, par exemple. Une communauté donnée va être va marchander sa proximité avec un groupe armé, de sorte qu'en retour, ce groupe armé lui permet de pouvoir aller tranquillement accéder au point d'eau et pouvoir assurer la survie de son troupeau. Ça, c'est un, un lien clair qui, qui montre qu'effectivement, les questions de ressources naturelles, d'accès à l'eau, de gouvernance foncière, font que certaines communautés poussent même les jeunes à rejoindre les groupes armés pour que ces jeunes les aident à assurer l'accès à ces, à, ces, à, ces, à ces points d'eau ou à ces ressources naturelles. Pour revenir à la question des, 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 des groupes armés, et clairement, euh, nous, euh, dans l'organisation dans laquelle est, on est, on n'a pas mandat à travailler avec les groupes armés, clairement. Donc, on n'a pas d'interaction directe avec les groupes armés. Mais une chose est sûre, dans un contexte comme celui de, 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 de Menaka ou celui de la Brook du, du, du Moon, par exemple, tous les groupes armés ont un fondement communautaire. Tous les groupes armés sont, sont adossés à des communautés. Donc, le fait de pouvoir travailler avec ces communautés et pouvoir distiller un peu la pensée ou l'approche que nous voulons faire, déjà, c'est des informations qui remontent de façon indirecte aux groupes armés parce que chaque groupe armé a, on va dire, un fondement communautaire. Chaque groupe armé a adossé à une communauté donnée. Donc, le fait de pouvoir travailler avec ces communautés, c'est une manière indirecte de pouvoir influencer un peu l'action des... De, 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 de ces groupes armés sans y aller directement parce que en tant que merci quoi à l'époque on n'a pas le mandat de travailler directement avec les, 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 les groupes armés c'était pour les deux questions je regarde si pas s'il y a autre question me concernant That's great thanks uh, thanks uh, Aliou uh, difficult uh, challenges uh, but important ones about the connections between community and uh, and armed groups that are manipulating and controlling access to resources. Uh, Celia, I'm not sure we have Fadiga, so maybe I'll go back to you. Um, lots of questions around measurement. Uh, we struggle, uh, you know, whether it's an 18-month project or a three-year project uh, to demonstrate how we make uh, a difference uh, to the taxpayers that uh, ultimately finance our good work. Uh, so we're all interested in longer durations, uh, but even if it's a bit longer, we still need to measure. So uh, any advice to, to us about, you know, what kinds of things we measure and this broad range of organizations in the UN system that we're trying to encourage to get involved in peace building. I want them to measure peace building, even if they're, you know, a kid's organization or they're an agricultural organization. So, so any advice to us uh, around how we measure some of this stuff? I wish I had some <laughs> definitive answers. I think uh, as as a as a practitioner myself, we've been struggling with this for many years. But I, I mean, I think the long and short of it is that integrated programming requires integrated, you know, measurement and integrated um, indicator frameworks. And this is not something we're 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 always seeing across climate security programming. Um, so obviously, there are. Uh, you know, there's a need for kind of peace and security, kind of classic peace and security indicators. But in climate security, we would also be looking to measure contributions to sustainability, to, you know, adaptation, including, you know, livelihoods, um, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I think the, 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 the long and short of it is that quantitative indicators in this um, kind of joint space um, are not ideal and don't even begin to capture the kinds of shifts and changes um that uh that we are trying to measure in this kind of programming um at field level um so i think it requires a, a mix of different kinds of data um including shifts in attitudes uh perceptions and and confidence 
Um, it also requires capturing individual voices um, and stories to kind of uh, illustrate and, and understand impact um, at the community level. And more than anything, I think it requires a commitment to longer term measurement. Um, and coming back to your point, Brian, about um, the kind of length of projects. I mean, it's it's obviously a, a very significant um, challenge to, to, to measure uh, changes um, in kind of conflict uh, dynamics over a very short space of time. It's even a greater challenge to measure um, changes in kind of environmental conditions. Um, and so thinking about mechanisms, um, and I, I know the review uh, points to sort of iterative projects, but even outside of iterative projects, thinking about mechanisms to measure, to continue to measure impacts at the level, for example, of the portfolio, even when projects have, have ended, um, I think is, a really, uh, is, is really key if we're going to continue to, to advance in this space. So we do have models for integrated, you know, kind of indicator frameworks um, that draw from programming on uh, peace and security, as well as kind of environmental programming and, 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 and socially oriented programming that I think, you know, are good uh, initial models for, um, for projects, but obviously, uh, you know, need to be adapted to, to context. But I think we need to, you know, clearly be, be more expansive about what we consider uh, to be an indicator. And as I said, try to capture qualitative information um, in a different way. Um, as we as we try to better understand, um, you know, the the impact of our actions on the ground and over a longer space of time. <laughs> I know that's not a very popular answer with the PBF, <laughs> but uh, we we need to find a mechanism for doing that. Thanks. Thanks. I, we we do want to do longer projects. The the challenge is to demonstrate what is the small step or the incremental step that has taken place in the course of a two or three year period, even if we'd like to be engaged for six years or nine years, um, to just sort of say, look, it takes 20 years, so I can't tell you anything about what we did in two years, uh, that's a non-starter. Uh, that, uh, that doesn't raise resources uh, for, for investment. Uh, I'm gonna go back to Ollie and Erica. I think you've been able to look at the questions. There's a few in there uh, highlighted uh, for, for, uh, for both of you. Some of them about maladaptation and climate response and its effects. Uh, some are some around uh, catalytic and how you really be catalytic, uh, and uh, and some around the differences, but the nuances between climate security and and environmental uh, peace building. Some of us just uh, throw it all together, um, but maybe some nuances there. So we have a couple of minutes left, colleagues. We might go a little bit past the top of the hour, but not very much. Uh, Oliver, uh, back to you. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, I wanted to segue neatly on from your point about catalytic role, which also picks on what, up on what Cydia was saying about measuring impact. Um, Jerome and Brenda are asking about, you know, how does PBF get, get have this catalytic impact for scale and sustainability? And I guess what I saw is there's at least three dimensions of this potential catalytic role. The first two of which PBF is, I think, really good at. The third is what is maybe one, is one to think about more. So the first one is really this catalytic role in terms of changing the overall debate. As we were saying, the PBF, by leaning into these issues, is creating that space to bring in these issues together to talk about you know, climate change, security, resources, gender, and so on. So it's catalyzing a wider change in the debate. The second, and we haven't really touched on this so far, but is is that that thing you talked about, Brian, in your introduction, which is in the DNA of PBF, which is to encourage UN agencies to work together, which you hear a lot of grumbling about when you're speaking to the different implementers, because it's always difficult and it creates friction and tensions. But actually, from our perspective, was so important in terms of bringing these different perspectives together, bringing these different areas of expertise together when we have this issue that, as Eric was saying, it crosses borders, both kind of physical and of, you know, the silos of the internet UN system. So that's the second area in which I think it's creating that catalytic role um, across the different implementing agencies that are doing it. And also, as Alia was saying, into some of the NGOs um, in terms of actually providing resources to those NGOs particularly where the situation like in Liptek Agorma is very difficult to operate in and you can get resources um, at the more local level. Um, so that's also playing a catalytic role. The third one, and we've talked about already, is this longitudinal 
catalytic role in terms of what can you achieve in a two to three year funding window. Um, and again, we've talked about the, some of the challenges of that, so I won't I won't dwell on that now. But back to you. We're both uh, unmuting at the same time. Erica, over to you. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I mean, just to pick up on a few of the comments that I saw across, and thank you all for this feedback, and I hope we can continue the discussion beyond this. Um, yeah, on the catalytic impact and sort of how do you, what do you do within two years? How do you measure some change? I mean, certainly this is where maybe we see a role for more iterative projects, which maybe don't disrupt the PBF model, but actually are a really positive way to say, okay, we're measuring some things that are happening, but we're also using this experience to test what's happening going forward. So the Yemen case study was actually two interlinked projects that really were testing the same model but using it in different areas and they made tweaks. That also is a good example to someone else's question was what's an example where it has been picked up and scaled up. So that project initially had started from a pilot um, that was uh, unconnected to that. You had these two iterative projects and then it was picked up by other donors and implemented in a number of parts of Yemen because it's a problem across all of the different governorates of Yemen. So there are isolated examples of this happening, but this is why we would emphasize trying to take more of a strategic approach because I think a lot of these and trying to interlink conversations with other donors, conversations with the climate one, as well as what's needed to kind of um, support and learn from these projects. So very often we saw that projects were just starting to get headway in two years, or they were just trying to figure out how the theory of change might be linked in. And then it ends, it doesn't automatically get picked up by another donor because there hasn't been enough time for the results to kind of get out there and be transmitted. So I think ideally what we'd see is maybe if you see a project that's starting to show results, is there a way that you can pick it up again in an iterative project? And we saw some examples of this in the PBF one, but it might be even more. And as you're doing that, can you be really more deliberate in the second round about how are we learning? What is the theory of change related to climate security that's being tested here? And then how do we connect this up to other broader climate change adaptation activities? So really just trying to, where you see that promise happening in a project, try to extend the life of it. Um, and then just because we're already over time, I'll just emphasize on that element of, of how do you measure impact? And I think as, as Soya was saying, it is often difficult. You do need this combination of looking at environmental and other factors. But I think the biggest deficit that we saw was that some projects, you know, for, for many reasons, it's really hard to implement these projects. There's a lot going on, but there wasn't always a lot of reflection on whether whether the theory, like just asking themselves, had the theory of change proved valid? We reached the end of a project and we didn't necessarily know. Do you think that this approach worked? What part of this approach worked? Do you, and, and sometimes when we ask that question in interviews, people had a very strong answer and it was not something that was built into the project document. It was, for example, the way that the project started a conversation with government authorities or with local communities about the interrelation between climate and peace. That was often the biggest impact. And so I think some of sometimes we can get too focused on indicators as opposed to what are we actually learning from the experience of these projects. Um, I'll just stop there because I know we're already five minutes over. I mean, I could go into more of these questions. Oh, just one more I wanted to add on to um, about the engagement with the non-state actors. Um, we surveyed all of the 74 projects. I'd say about 80% of them were predominantly focused on local peace building. And in those, the vast majority are working with community or non-state actors at some levels, sometimes also with local government authorities, but particularly when you're talking about the ones that were taking place in these conflict affected and fragile spaces where frankly, local authorities were more absent. What was more common was for them to be working through community-based actors. So non-state actors in the sense of members of the community, not in the sense of non-state actor armed groups, for example, which were often within the problem set, but obviously weren't a partner with most of the engagements. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Fantastic. I'm sure, but Ryan, we don't want to run too much over time, but we could delve into many of these questions in a much greater depth. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, it's uh, excellent uh, uh, publicity for those uh, interested to pursue more of these questions. Uh, Fadiga, we lost you for a moment. Uh, do you, I'll give you 60 seconds if there's one final parting shot you'd like to give to everybody, and then I'm going to wrap it up because we are <laughs> over time. 
OK, I'll take the, six, the, the 60 seconds, make, make it maybe 70. Uh, my, my, for no reason, my computer went off, so I had to restart it. I've, I've heard finally some of the contributions and which I align with. And, and, and I think back in the days when I used to write and implement uh, PBF projects in, in countries such as Guinea, I remember that the, the main advocacy that we'll do to PBSO would be to really uh, aim for projects that, are, that go maybe on the longer term in terms of implementation. It gives us more uh, time to see the dividends of acti activities that are linked to livelihood holds or climate change etc and this has been mentioned here today i think it is important to, to really put that also on the table in terms of measurement fao has really have been implementing uh, a few tools uh, we have various tools uh, to measure impact whether it is resilience or climate resilience climate risk uh, when it comes to the link with between climate uh, cca climate change adaptation and uh, conflict within the, the, the cadre partnership uh, that you mentioned before in terms of disaster risk reduction. But it is that is it's undoubted and that there is undoubtedly need to do more work that connects the dot with conflicts. That is true. That is something and it is in the making that there are there are there are researchers done in, in this area. And I think it has been mentioned that the difficulty of using one indicator or one tool or one factor is greater when it comes to connecting climate risk with with conflict but anyways there are there are there are work that is that are done that are used tools that are used and uh, that we connect together in order to to have better measurement but i would like to move one second from measurement not solely uh, focusing on measurement and mentioning the the the, the need of mainstreaming um uh, learning agendas because this is really also important when you integrate ag a, a learning agenda in most of your projects you have the possibility to learn to adapt uh, because we've been implementing for more than 50 years projects in the UN and today we're really looking forward to to having a mainstreaming of this learning process that we integrate in our different projects to make sure that at the end of the project from the beginning to the end we have a learning process that goes along with all the monitoring and follow up to, to 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 give us by the end of the project really good practices that we can implement to correct, adapt, and maybe have better 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 project by the end. I see you smiling. I'm way over my 60 seconds. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, so first off, uh, big thanks to uh, Nagina Kaitova who organized all this. Anybody who sent in questions or who had questions that doesn't uh, didn't get an answer, I'm sure our panelists and uh, presenters will be pleased to engage further with you. So if you don't know how to get in touch with them directly based on this, get in touch with Nagina and uh, she'll connect you. And uh, I take the occasion to thank Nagina for all her hard work. Thank you, Erica and uh, Ollie. Uh, thank you, panelists. Um, uh, we are extending the time frames for PBF projects. So in uh, countries that are fully eligible, they can be up to three years. Cross-border projects also up to three years. So we're trying to do that. We're uh, piloting an inception phase uh, to projects to try to give more time up front and more engagement of local communities in the design. You think it's a wonderful thing, but we then struggle uh, with UN agencies to take up the offer uh, because they're all driven by single year uh, deliverable resource mobilization targets and they just want to, you know, write the project and get the money. So, you know, it's a cultural change that we're talking about. We are trying. I like the idea about iterative programming. I'm not quite sure how to uh, uh, find ways to uh, administer that. We do often do phase twos of projects. Um, so, you know, we get at that a little bit. We, we start to get questions from uh, our management about, yeah, but you're supposed to be catalytic, so why are you doing phase two? So, you know, there's sometimes cross purposes between those two, but but we really do aim to be uh, uh, flexible and uh, and we want to we want to figure out how to do that. Learning qualitative measurement. Uh, People online, if you are applying for PBF programming, include in the programs learning and qualitative, you know, social research. We're happy to finance that. We need you to do it. We can't find we can't do that from our small little team sitting in New York. So we need your projects to take that learning approach that Fadiga was talking about and incorporate 
survey work, perception work, data collection work, focus groups, the qualitative social research that we need to tell the stories about how all of the work that is done actually makes a difference and is and is therefore a valuable investment from the part of our donors. I really like the emphasis also on engaging local authorities. So, you know, it's uh, we're a member state organization, so we're inherently very government oriented. So, of course, we're always trying to move away from that and engage civil society more. But it's not civil society at the expense of government. It's about the relationship between authorities and communities that we're trying to get at and getting those local authorities involved both in borderlands projects and in regular peace building projects, but also across borders is really important. I, too, like everybody else, could talk about this for a long time. Uh, we're well over time now. Uh, thank you all of you for tuning in. I wish we were in a big hall so that I could see smiling faces all around, uh, but I see at least uh, five smiling faces on the screen, so that'll keep me going for the rest of the day. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, merci beaucoup. Uh, and uh, please visit uh, our, our website uh, to get the full report and learn more. Thank you.